Okay, so that's apparently the, the best we're going to do. Um, hello, welcome to the, the Friday Lightning Talk session. Uh, it's good to see such a large audience. Um, we are a bit behind, and we're going to struggle to fit everyone in. So we're going to try and, and see what the best we can do is. Um, for these Lightning Talks, each speaker has 10 minutes. Uh, and I'll set a 10-minute timer on, on this thing. Uh, and when the 10 minutes is done, we will interrupt them with a really loud, loud uh, round of applause. And so just to practice that, if we could do a round of applause. OK, so the kind of Okay, that seems to work. Um, so first up is Una talking about Van Eck freaking. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Una, and I like signals. I thunk up this lightning talk idea literally on the plane here from Helsinki. So it's a lightning talk in many senses. It's about Van Eck freaking, and I'm going to explain what it means. Vanek freaking means eavesdropping a signal that it's not supposed to be sent in the first place. Uh, signals from electro electric devices like electromagnetic radiations via radio or electric cables. And it's named after this Wim Van Eck, who published a paper in uh, 85. But he noticed this phenomenon in CRT displays this old type uh, cathode ray tube displays that take, they can be listened to with a radio at a distance and you can actually see the image, uh, copy the image and view it yourself at a distance so they are not secure at all. Now, some explaining needed. This is an image of my antenna that I call the hacksaw um, I use it to listen to 446 megahertz radios. Actually, I spent my summer holiday doing that. But um, I started noticing a strong interference at 446, just below 446 megahertz, at 445.49. And I was thinking, what could it be? Uh, I could only hear it in my home. So I started investigating it, and it sounded like a video signal. Now, when I told my friend that it sounded like a video signal, he was pretty confused because how can anything sound like video? But when I was a child, I used to hook up my NES uh, Nintendo, the 8 pin Nintendo, the wrong way, so that the video signal was actually, by mistake, fed into the audio channels. So it made this very peculiar and very distinctive noise. And I recognized that noise immediately. This must be video. And I was actually here in the 60 hertz uh, vertical synchronization pulse there. Now, the frequency was very odd. 445. Why would it be 445? And then I noticed if you calculate the pixel clock frequency of this particular very weird display mode, you get, and then once multiplied by three, you get 445.490. So I was thinking it could definitely be a display, but how can I hear a display on the radio? And shouldn't this only be applicable to CRTs, which are analog, and I'm pretty sure nobody is using a CRT display in my home. So I wrote a little program uh, using C++ and OpenCV. I call it Gempest, named after Tempest, which I believe it's a military term some, uh, related in some way to these kind of emanations. Uh, this is a screenshot, screenshot of the SAID program, and I'm receiving an image of the Google homepage on my HDMI display, which is situated just two meters from my computer. And I'm doing it with this small radio. This is a uh, about the size of a matchbox, it's called AirSpy R2. 
and a small antenna. Uh, just to describe the image, it's black and white, and there, there's a lot of interference, but you can definitely see the Google logo and some browser uh, user interface elements there. This is the result of integration from many uh, consequential images. So I don't actually get the video feed where every frame is this clear, but um, most pictures on an HDMI display are very static anyway. So I can integrate at a second, a seconds of time and get a pretty clear image. But the mapping from color to the signal level that I'm, re that I'm uh, receiving is still a bit of a mystery. Here I have uh, four gradients of color and grayscale, and below are the same gradients received with my radio. So it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. There is the received pattern is sort of a striped bat pattern. So I still have a lot of things to do with this. But I'm hopeful that it will someday give me a clearer image. What I could do, I could... Um, I've heard the ASPI can be set to a higher bandwidth mode some way with a custom firmware, but I haven't done it yet. Or maybe I could just use a higher bandwidth radio, but then uh, the USB bandwidth will probably be a, um, a limiting factor at some point. Now, I had the video link, but I'm not going to try it out on this because it's not my laptop and <laughs> I don't know what happens. Okay, I got the go ahead there, so I don't even know uh, how many seconds I have left. Yes, hello. So, anyway, this is such a video which uh, shows basically the same thing that was, I was talking about has my ASPI radio and just me looking at the spectrum uh, on a spectrum analyzer and here's my HDMI display about a meter away from my laptop where I view the image on this uh, program that I showed earlier And it sees that when I scroll the, scroll the page, it's pretty real time. And it has some needs, needs hackery statistics on the left side as well. And I uh, need to improve those. Then I also show that I can receive uh, the image, even if the display is in an adjacent room, by using a slightly bigger antenna. Actually, it's the same antenna you saw in the beginning. <laughs> but this is not something you can do sneakily. It's about 80 centimeters long and has uh, many spiky elements coming out of it. But I can still uh, receive the image if I wait long enough. And here the text is pretty clearly visible. And we can also see the long integration time. It blurs the text, but it also uh, removes any time-related noise from the image. Um, the signal speed is about 10 million samples per second. Okay, let's not use the next video. Thank you. That was my lightning talk. Now they're both on. Um, for timing, can you please just uh, audibly, you don't need the mic, just say like five, three, 
Yep, yeah, sure. There you go. Can I, what, sorry? Can I can blank it. Is that better? I can have the house lights down. No. One second. Uh, okay, well, this one's as well. La, there. Uh, yes. Can that light be turned off? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Sai. I am partially blind, namely I am super light sensitive. So I can't see anything if I'm facing this way because that light is way too bright for me. Um, if I were facing the other way, I'd be able to see just fine. I'm teaching uh, some workshops on blind navigation as well as a talk you can come to today at 4.15 by the trees in the center area. Right now, I'm going to teach you how to be an asshole to blind people. Um, with TQ, my assistant, as the example person. Now, we all know that as kids, we learn object permanence, right? Um, so TQ, could you please pick up the bottle that you put down on the other chair? Yeah, so please don't move my stuff. Um, if I put it down in a given location, now can you pick it up? There you go. Um, so that's step one. Um, step two, um, consent is important, right? Uh, so TK, stand up, um, and let's pretend that the edge of the stage is a curb that you're walking up to. Uh, and so we're just standing here waiting for the light, um, and TQ probably has his hand on the little nub that uh, shows when something is about to uh, change and it's safe to walk. And I come up and say, oh, blind person, let me pull you in the right direction. Now, TQ, can you point in the direction uh, that we were facing, the back, of the, the back of the tent? We were facing in this direction. Good. Um, however, uh, if you do this and you don't know which way I'm going, uh, or frankly, you don't have my consent, don't. Uh, instead, there are a couple ways you can approach someone. Hi, would you like directions? That's one way. If you want them to know where you are, you can use the back of your hand, not the front, because that's grabby, back on arm, and just say, hi, would you like directions? Um, Next, uh, hint, blind people are blind. Uh, people don't always realize this. So for example, let's say, TQ, you're asking me how to get to the pedestrian entrance of EMF. I say, oh, well, you just go that way, head straight, and you'll, it, it'll be right next to the white tent. Uh, that tells you nothing. Um, if instead I say, oh, so you go out of this tent, um, you shoreline right, there's that tent entrance is on the right, turn right at that, you'll hit, uh, go straight, you'll hit the, the paving, turn right on the paving, turn left when you can on more paving, and walk along that path until you reach the pedestrian entrance. That is something that TQ actually probably can do and I've only trained him for like one hour. Um, if you don't know the term short, if you don't know the term shorelining, just say follow the path. Yes. Um, so shorelining is uh, a simple technique, um, which actually we can demonstrate with the edge of the stage. So uh, walk along the edge of the stage and don't walk off of it. Um, so to follow a edge. Um, 
and follow parallel is just yeah then we, then we run into the wires um, is a matter of following a line so if you expect someone to cross uh, across a open area things aren't going to go well unless they're following you directly. Um, if you want someone to follow you directly, the bad way to do it is this. Hey, T, you, follow me. Yeah, so um, if I can't hear you, I can't follow you. Um, a better way to do it is to say, uh, hey, T, you, follow me. Nice and audible. Um, and all I'm doing there is just scuffing my feet. Another way is if you want to lead someone, sorry, yes. If you want to lead someone, bad way. Grab and we're going to go this way. This is also known as a come along hold for police. Not a good thing to remind people of. Instead, offer your hand, say, would you like to follow me? And then they can hold you on the hand or the shoulder or the elbow, and then you just walk wherever it is, and it's fun. That way, they're in control of whether they're holding you or not, uh, not you. Uh, and it doesn't feel like uh, it's um, being grabbed. Um, another thing, um, TQ, walk uh, straight towards me. Um, with a, with um, with a full sweep. So don't do this. Don't cross along the line. You can tell, you know, blind person coming towards you. They're sweeping their cane. Uh, you can see me coming. Uh, I can't see you necessarily unless you're really loud. Um, if you walk across the line of my cane. Uh, you're going to get tangled up on it, and I'm going to get disoriented, and you're probably going to trip. Uh, don't do that. Um, if, you're if you're following next to a blind person, um, so we're walking together, um, don't walk in front because you're going to be in the way of the cane sweep, um, and don't walk uh, between them and a wall, or in this case, the chairs, because those are used as a reference. Um, instead, walk slightly behind them um, and to the side. So this way, I can follow TQ um, if he continues walking, and there's not really a problem. And yes, I have my eyes closed. I can't see shit. Um, but um, yeah. So that's another, um, what other things have people done to me in the last week? <laughs> um, don't grab the cane. So um, if you're uh, trying to tidy things up or something and Tiki puts his cane down and I grab it and you know, put it somewhere else and he goes to reach for wherever it was, not a good idea. Um, how would you like it if I grabbed your eyeballs? Um, uh, I, I, that's not an understatement, unfortunately. Also, please don't grab me by the eyeballs and like point them unless I specifically request you to do that. Do not do this. Do not grab this because I am uh, while talking to you, I am also monitoring, for example, the existence of this cable so that I don't trip on it, um, and how far I am, and uh, whether there is ground movement from cars and things like that. Uh, and also, this is an extension of me. It is my eyes. If you grab this and move it, you are grabbing me by the eyeballs, and I'm going to be really, really resisting putting you on the ground. Um, so far, I have not had to do that, but um, please don't. So if you would like to learn how to actually navigate with a cane, um, I'm giving a workshop and a talk. Please come. 
Uh, uh, there's information on the schedule, or s.ai slash emf. Um, it's not all about the cane. In fact, it's uh, a lot about sound. Not as much as you might think, and more than you might think. So for instance, that tap is enough for me to know the contour of the room, how tall it is, uh, and roughly where the door is. Uh, if you don't know why, come learn. Um, same thing for wind. You can feel uh, a wall that you're next to. Uh, you can smell things. You can tell which orientation uh, a corridor is. It's a lot of senses beyond your eyes, and we use all of them. So thank you very much. Uh, next, please. Awesome. Hello, everybody. My name is Yu Wenlin. Um, I. I'm a sociologist. I spent nearly 20 years now um, um, gaining my abilities to observe and to interview people in the hackers' communities. But today I'm not going to talk about hacker culture. I'm going to talk about Park Run. How many people here have um, heard about Park Run? Right, quite a few of you. How many of you are going to run tomorrow? No? OK. <laughs> Well, hopefully, today's talk is going to inspire you to go to the park run, go to a park run tomorrow, and then just to um, see the park run from a different point of view. And the talk is going to be based on my sociological insight. It's not sponsored by park run. And I put the slide very quickly together last night when my little one was sleeping, so I do apologize if it's not the best um, slides you've ever seen. So for those of you who haven't heard of Park Run, it's a free weekly 5K time run, which are open to everyone above four years old. And um, it's usually quite safe. And then there's lots of volunteers and first aiders and to not first aiders necessarily on site, but it's relatively safe compared to many other runs. And it began in the UK in 2004, and it's gained a lot of publicity and um, popularity as well in the past years. And um, But this is like a mile by you either like it or hate it. And then there are a lot of existing studies on park run. For instance, there's one funded by Cancer Research UK in 2014, and uh, they're looking to why parkrun is so successful for uh, changing people's lifestyles and changing people's behaviors. But these are uh, these research are done by people in the Department of Health, and they're looking to this citizen-led community participation and prevention. They conclude that each park run creates active and inclusive physical culture, and then park run's approach can help a cross-section of participants from diverse social backgrounds, as well as the people who didn't previously identify as runners. And so they, they did a survey and interview with people, and so basically to identify those key features for their success. But as a sociologist, I like to kind of make things more complicated. So I use this concept called infrastructuring, and turning the infrastructure as a verb and to understand how parkrun become infrastructured, become more institutionalized. So I, uh, most of my uh, research is based on the concept developed by Susan Lee Starr and Kieran Ruder in 1996, so it's quite long ago. And they look into this distributed um, information infrastructure. So they analyze the levels of infrastructural complexity involved in system assess and designer users communication and they look into how things work and in 2007 in the united states and elsewhere in europe and there's a growing interest in understanding large uh, scale cyber infrastructure again that people look into the history of and theory of infrastructure so my uh, kind of background is from um, my interest is based on this kind of intellectual discussion 
And now I'm going to summarize and share with you and these seven things I've observed about the success of Park Run. Number one, it's usually got this standard format. It's very predictable. Every Saturday, 9 a.m. start. Usually, there's some variation in some local different areas, such as in Scotland and Ireland or some other countries or location. And with the standard format, it's easy to set up. And for instance, there's um, barcodes and the tokens that you can receive. And then there's also standard sign signage. It's very well signposted. And there's cones, for instance. And so each, even the wrong directors, they are um, giving the speech in based on a, the same script. There might be some different, depends on people's performance skills, but most of the time they are saying to the people, to the runners, the same thing every Saturday. Second point, uh, if you want to start the park run, you are offered a budget of up to 3,000 pounds. And so that is quite handy. So you know, you are not left without anything. And so you have a means. Number three, uh, digital technologies really help over here. So there's a part run website, for instance, and they publish recorded time. It's a database of all the runners and all the time, all the activities, including volunteers. And um, there's apps, um, app, mobile phone apps for scanning, and there's also mobile phone app for timing. So in, in, you don't fully rely on timer. and anymore, so it, lots of things can be automated and save time. But even so, there's lots of volunteers involved, and we have to thank the volunteers, and they marshal, they organize things, they ensure everything runs, and uh, also the community is supported by lots of entertaining things, um, such as podcasts, and there are a lot of different series, including free weekly time, part run adventures, the part run show, or with me now. And there's also some related uh, talks, such as marathon talk. And these are some photographs that I've taken. These are the wrong director. They are putting the time um, into the database, and so the runners can receive their time. It's actually quite laborious. And um, so no doubt that it's a hard job. And then also volunteers standing in the rain and um, try to marshal runners. So the community is a huge thing behind. And over here, I just like to highlight you know, different kind of volunteers. So for instance, over here, the volunteer, it says deaf volunteers. So they do the sign language um, for the runners. So if you can't hear the wrong directors talking, then at least you can see the um, sign language. So it's quite interesting. I've seen it um, in two different park runs now, one in Edinburgh, and then this one is in Plain near Stirling. And Number five, you've got support from public authorities. It's got recognition from the public authority, like local councils allow the runners to use the park, or NHS GPs or nurses and um, prescribe uh, patients to do the park run. So that help as well. Then branding is another big thing. So for instance, park run has got this very pretty logo and it was a different, it looked different before, and then they've just recently kind of rebrand themselves. And so the token, for instance, look different now. They've also got sponsorship, it's increasing. For instance, Fitbit, a lot of other um, sport equipment, they also sponsor Park Run. And over here is a local Park Run at Falkirk in Scotland being sponsored by Victoria Harris. Harris. So different Park Run might get different sponsorship. And the last thing I think is very crucial is because it's free and then people don't have to pay to do a marathon or to do a 5K every uh, week. So that's the reason why um, it's relatively attractive to a lot of people. So however, from the sociological perspective, sociologists like to make things complicated. So we like to look into controversies. So for instance, there are lots of issues that we don't usually pay attention to including, for instance, what stops people from attending. It could be um, people might have their caring responsibility, that, for instance, I have to find somebody to mind my children, otherwise I won't be able to do a part run every Saturday morning. And um, there's also um, are people, if you are disabled or um, 
fly, for instance, and how do you take part in if this is really good for your health? And then how do we encourage more people to take part? How do we encourage more people to become this community? What do we mean by community anyway? And so it's quite interesting to look into, for sociologists to look into different kind of localized practices. For instance, how the tokens were received in different backgrounds, as so different communities have different um, um, arrangements. So for sociologists, this kind of helped me to understand. It's very interesting and help to move beyond the asymmetry and neutrality of background so we can problematize a background. So um, my time is nearly up. Um, i just like to um, say that tomorrow morning there will be a few people going to this Twickerbury, um, maybe my pronunciation is not right, this park room, and then people are going to leave the EMF campsite around 8 o'clock, and then there's a wiki page about the park run tomorrow. And I would say park run is like a mile bite, and you don't have to run it, you can walk the 5K as well. There will be the tail walker in, uh, in uh, every uh, run, and then you don't have to worry that you won't be the last one because there will be the tail walker who will be walking either with you or behind you. Um, but if you don't try, you won't know if this is something you would like or hate. So I would kind of encourage you to come to the park run tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, that was a feeble clap. Um, so our last lightning talk should be Dan Williams. Cool, I have your slides. This one? Yeah, that's right. Beginning. <laughs> Great, thanks for being Hi everyone, I'm Dan. And um, this talk is essentially uh, a slideshow of photos from a recent holiday of mine. Um, a while back, I became interested in radio quiet zones, uh, and I became quite fascinated with them. And there are these places, uh, geographical spaces, where um, because there's something special in that place, they don't want any um, man-made radio signals to be transmitted there. There's a few around the world for different purposes, some for like military surveillance monitoring purposes, some for radio telescopes. There's some in China, South Africa, Australia, and the most famous is this one, the US National Radio Quiet Zone. It's 100 miles by 100 miles square in West Virginia in the Allegheny Mountains. And in this zone, uh, you're not allowed to use FM radio, TV signals, Wi-Fi, mobile phones, any kind of uh, artificial radio signal is forbidden. Uh, and this zone exists for two different facilities. Um, there is a, uh, a military base and there's a radio telescope. And in this space, the kind of priorities of um, how we use radio is different. Normally, we prioritize like people communicating. In this case, there's a different priority. Um, and so when I got interested in radio quiet zones, I did what I normally do when I get fascinated by something. I set up a Google alert. And I found that there's like three main things that people write about radio quiet zones. There's like academic papers with like research results, which I have no idea what they're on about. There is the second type, which is um, the results from people searching for alien life because they like to use these radio telescopes. And there's the third kind, which is every about six months, a mainstream publication like, say, the Washington Post or the BBC go to the US National Radio Quiet Zone. Never one of the other ones, always this one. And they kind of write basically the exact same story every time. They write about how this place is like trapped in the 1950s, that you can't like, you know, text your friends, you have to use landlines, you have to use post. You can't even like turn on the TV. And um, they always also, as well as profile uh, what life's like there for normal people, they always profile the um, people who come there because they are uh, allergic to Wi-Fi or phone signals. Um, yeah. Uh, and it kind of has the same template. And I thought, this place looks fascinating. I want to go back to like 1950s pre-technology America. So I went on a road trip. Um, luckily, I had two friends who were heading there. Uh, Tom Scott and Matt Gray, who were doing a video for YouTube. Uh, I was just going along as a tourist and like kind of tagging along. And it's this like wonderful, eerie rural place. It was like covered in mist as we drove the hundred miles into the square. And uh, there are like only the two sites to see. There's the military base, which has shut down and is now for sale. 
So if you can convince the estate agent that you're in the market for it, you could go visit it on an open day. Uh, unfortunately, uh, couldn't do that. So we went to the other place, Green Bank, which is the home of the radio telescope. It's got um, the telescope, the Robert C. Bird radio telescope. It is the world's largest steerable radio telescope. Um, it's named after the former senator of the state, I believe, who was really good at getting government funding for stuff. So everyone's a big fan of him. Um, and it's massive. Like, I'm not sure I can convey how big it is. Uh, like, there are other radio telescopes on the site. Uh, this one, like, dwarfs over them as you climb up it. Um, it's kind of got this kind of weird pixelated vibe. It's made up of, like, hundreds of little panels that are individually steerable to fine-tune the signal. And, like, it's so big that this is how big the nuts and bolts it's made of are. Um, as well as being, like, quite enormous, it's uh, incredibly sensitive. Um, when you get near it, there's a buffer zone around it where you, you can't enter without permission. They don't allow, say, petrol vehicles near it because the spark plugs in the engine create too much interference. Um, it's so sensitive that this poster, which looks like it's made in MATLAB next to the telescope, warns you that even turning on a digital camera next to it can be picked up by the telescope in their results. Which means they've got um, a special van, the radio finding van. This is the van that they drive around the zone filled with radio receiving equipment so they can track down any interfering signal. So if you've bought a Wi-Fi router inside this zone, they will come to you and find you. Uh, but largely, uh, most of the interference doesn't come from other people in the zone. It comes from uh, the facility itself. As one of the staff members told us, they are their own worst enemy. Um, the actual instruments they put on the telescope cause interference. So they've got um, a team of people and an anechoic chamber. And what they do is they take the scientific instruments that researchers have sent them and they'll build special boxes for them that won't cause interference. Uh, and the campus itself doesn't really have scientists, physicists, people doing research. It's mainly like an engineering facility. It's people fixing the telescope, building the telescope, writing the software to control the telescope. It's basically like any engineering department in university. There's like workshops and labs and lots of uh, academic papers stapled to the wall. Um, and as you walk around the facility, you can't really feel any different from like if you're in a non-radio quiet zone it's pretty much the same apart from like these weird traces you bump into like in the canteen the microwave has like this really beefy metal box around it so that it doesn't cause interference like they earth their toolboxes um there's landline phones and phone books everywhere like no one will mind you asking to use their phone um at one point as we were walking around the uh, office building like an announcement comes in the tannoy saying like mike mike please contact the front desk immediately and someone like leans out their office and goes mike what have you broken this time there was someone we were trying to meet up with and we were like oh is that person meeting us at three and they were like i don't know we've got to go back to my office to check the email rather than check it on their phone but like throughout the day it kind of slowly appeared that this kind of like complete ban on radio was slight exaggeration in the um, stories that, we, that we'd read. Like when we crossed into the zone, there wasn't like a sign telling you turn everything off now. Like it was like a multi-lane highway. We stopped in like a McDonald's that had free Wi-Fi inside the zone. There were entire towns and cities in there. Um, and it's not even like, hu like a hard isolated place to get to. It's got like a visitor center and a gift shop and like a viewing deck. So um, it's kind of not quite as I had imagined it in my head. I even took like an SDR radio and plugged it in next to the telescope and listened to see what was there. And you could like see um, like emissions from people's mobile phones, like people hadn't switched their phones off there, which uh, made me feel better about the earlier on in the day when I realized I'd like left my Fitbit on and that I used the wireless fob to close the car door and ugh. And as we were chatting in the uh, control room at the end of the day, staff members were starting to like tell us about all the different like wireless things that they had at home that they really shouldn't, but everyone does, so who cares kind of thing. Uh, and one of them mentioned, well, it's not like a forbidden zone. It's kind of more of a carefully managed and regulated space, but that's like a less catchy headline for a newspaper. Um, or as the sign in someone's office store said, Radio frequency management is done by experts who meld years of experience with a curious blend of regulations, electronics, politics, and not a little bit of larceny. They justify requirements, horse trade, 
coerce, bluff, and gamble with an intuition that can be taught other by long experience, which, I'll be honest, makes me love the place much more than just a total outright ban. I love that they've managed to still make a balance where you can live a normal life, yet prioritize radio research. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. That was the, the final lightning talk for today. Um, there is still space in the lightning talks on Sunday if somebody has become inspired. Uh, and just finally, could we thank all of the speakers just once again?